All right, cool. So, uh, Lincoln, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for welcoming me on the show, Eric. I appreciate you letting me be a guest tonight. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> no, no, definitely. We've been doing the uh, the Babe Talk podcast uh, a little bit now, and I really like uh, talking to you. I think we got good rapport, but also you do a lot of cool stuff uh, in your scene, the music scene, and just generally you seem like really uh, have a hand in music and, and other forms of art. So just for people who don't know who you are, can you say what you do professionally, say what you do in the scene, and uh, yeah, yeah, just give us that. Yeah. Definitely. I've got my hands into way too many different things right now, but <laughs> I feel the same way. A... <laughs> yeah, it's fun stuff, man. Um, by the day, I work as a creative director for a marketing company, uh, mainly focusing on like SEO and website building and stuff like that. And we also do a uh, clothing production company where we do custom silk screening and embroidery. And that's just to make money to do the fun stuff later on. Um, I run a small record label based out of uh, Apple Valley, California. It's called California Street Music. Uh, we focus mainly on punk, hardcore, and ska music. Um, all real close-knit family kind of people. We started off and just got the best dudes we knew together, got a meeting of the minds going and put that together. And We've had a couple releases going, and that's been pretty good too. And I also do artist relations for Dream Studio Guitars, which is a innovative little guitar company that was just born this year uh, that's been trying to push their way in and give some awesome quality instruments that aren't wall hangers uh, to the musicians out there. <laughs> that's so, a great, that is a fantastic way to describe that. That is exactly. awesome. Exactly. <laughs> we, we, we're, we're trying to make stuff that's not not art like your, your Gibson SG that's candy red and has the, the chrome pick guard and the chrome knobs and everything that's pretty on the wall are, and sounds like crap. Are you describing crap, my like, guitar? <laughs> <laughs> You're so, you are so close to what my guitar looks like. <laughs> that's insane. Yeah, but no, I totally see what you mean. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I have a lot of friends I go to their house they got four guitars on the wall, and they haven't picked one up in like five years. Yeah, exactly. And you definitely want to make a good product for playing as opposed to just, you know, a pretty pretty thing on your wall. I like that. Exactly, and that's like the first thing we did is we tossed a bass and two guitars in the hands of Forever Came Calling, uh, a pop punk band, I guess you'd call them, out of 29 Palms, California, because they've been... You've known them for a while? You've yeah. known them for a while? Yeah, yeah. For a little bit. And uh, threw some stuff in their hands because they've been touring pretty much nonstop the past year. Uh, they hit the Man Overboard Transit Tour, finished that, jumped right on for the Common Vision Tour, finished that. They had two days off, flew to Australia. They're in Australia now. They come back. They've got, like, the majority of September off, and then they're touring until the end of the year on the Pure Noise Tour. So we're like, ah, okay, they're going to be the ones who are going to give these instruments battle scars and throw them oh, around. Oh, they are. <laughs> give it the abuse they need, so they they got the first little chunk there, and we've just been trucking forward, and I've got hands in other little places we're trying to figure stuff out. But yeah, I that's, just like that's doing music awesome. stuff. Thank you. Dude, that's also with the... So, uh, Forever Came Calling, I mean, I remember I sent them, like, probably a Facebook message, I think, about three years ago, just about playing a show in Maryland. Like, they've been around in everybody's ears for, you know... Geez, when was that Warp Tour documentary they were? Uh, was that five years ago? Four? Yeah, yeah so like four years ago. ago. Uh, but they've been just nonstop hustling, and they remind me of oh, um, yeah. uh, another band uh, who's synonymous with hustling is Survey Says. Uh, oh, from Jersey. yeah. Mm -hmm. and I know we kind of like brought up Survey Says and uh, Forever Came Calling uh, on this week's Babe Talk, yes, but I just played a show with Survey Says and got to hang out with them all day uh, nice. and just hear them tell stories about the Real Big Fish tour going to Canada. Um, but no, like there's some, there, I feel like they're our East Coast version of Forever Came Calling as far as bands who hustle and just really go the extra mile to, to oh, do yeah. hard work. Heck yeah, Survey Says has been on a grind for a long time, and uh, I know I was talking to Brent, who's their drummer. I knew Brent, he did a band um, before he was in Survey Says called Save the Swim Team, which was kind of pop punk, uh, more hardcore band out here. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think he said like within the past year and a half or something, they've done like over 200 shows. Like they've just been on a nonstop grind. And, like, I can totally see how you can relate the two, like, for Game Calling Survey says. They've just been on a constant grind promotion. They're awesome dudes. They do whatever they can to try and get their name out there, try and make sure everybody knows who they are. Not even if they exactly like the music, but they 
they put themselves out there like no other. And oh, yeah. uh, Survey says is a great comparison. Good dudes, awesome music. Um, I've had the pleasure of talking to a couple of those guys a couple times. Like I said, Brent, awesome dude, and uh, cool I want to see them Brent. do good things. That's cool you mentioned Brent. Um, like right before we started this, uh, I had messaged him earlier today just saying, hey, it was good to meet you, da, da, da. and so we talked a little bit. And like right before we started this, uh, I was finishing up a conversation with him. Um, nice. But yeah, no, dude's dude's really cool. He made a joke. Uh, oh, so their 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 set got rained out. Oh, um, that sucks. Show. Yeah, no, it was really bad. And um, I don't know if you know the band Count to Four. They're also from Jersey. Yeah, I've heard of them uh, before. Yeah. The the storm picked up as they were playing. It was like two bands after we played, oh. and um, and the storm picked up. And I have it on video. I was taping their set for their singer Mike, and mm-hmm. um. And you watch it, and like you see, it starts sunny, then the clouds form, it starts raining, and I took shade like next to the stage, still <laughs> filming them. And as the set's going on, the water is pouring in from the sides of the stage, creating puddles of water on the oh, floor. No. Dudes in survey says are throwing towels over all the pedal boards because survey says it's playing <laughs> next. Um, um, and yeah. as 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 I'm filming, you can see Count to Four go closer and closer to the center of the stage as mm. pools of water force them like into oh, the center. Oh man! Before they finally, like the PA shut off and they finally canceled it. But um, but Brent, <laughs> after all that, Brent just goes, "Swear to God, if we only end up playing 199 shows this year because of this, I'm gonna be so pissed." This counts, right? <laughs> this counts. <laughs> it definitely counts. Rain shows are the worst because you never know what's going to happen with the equipment and environment like that. And especially dudes that are rocking like older gear. Like I've got some amps that are like older harmonies and older Wurlitzers and stuff like that with two prong plugs that oh. I barely trust on a normal stage. <laughs> and like sitting that stuff out in the rain, that's a no go. You're kind of you're kind of asking to have some kind of electrocution happen yeah, down the line there. Terrifying. Oh, so yeah. uh, that's so cool that you're you're into like you know so much about guitars and you're into old uh, amps and instruments. So um, I had mentioned this again on that same Babe Talk podcast, uh, uh-huh. but we didn't go too into it because you know wasn't a conversation with me and you. But I noticed you yeah. kind of perked up. So my dad is a famous jazz musician, and mm-hmm. he's made the switch to solo guitar in the last couple of years, and he's getting oh, nice. all sorts of accolades from this. Like he's got a couple of. Um, uh, a couple Grammy nominations, like a lot of cool shit's been happening. Oh, yeah, that's rad, dude. Yeah, dude, the last like four or five years. Nice. Um, but so uh, it's so he so he gave me, and I don't know if you recall this company. He gave me, I guess, yeah, like four or five years ago, um, a Kramer guitar that he got, Ooh. in, I guess, 1980, and he had like fixed it up, put Floyd Rose pickups on it, and it's just this gorgeous piece of like, oh, it's Ooh, not gorgeous. Kramers looking. are beautiful. Yeah, they're yeah, yeah. awesome <laughs> guitars. They're like. <laughs> So good. That's what I used in every band until this one, because for this one, I need the Gibson SG, because it's a pop-punk band, and Uh Gibson SG is like the auric vacuum of guitars. It's like eight pounds. You can throw Uh it around. It's Mm -hmm. tiny, and you can just, like, go nuts on it. um, Exactly, and it has a nice range of uh, different tones and styles you can get out of it, too, so it's pretty suitable for even if you guys want to go a little bit more harder and aggressive on a song, and you want to do a soft song, like... It's it's definitely the auric vacuum of yeah. <laughs> of a guitar like that's yeah. that's definitely suitable. I always use that Kramer for um uh, a couple of songs on this indie rock project I was on, a couple of songs on this straightforward rock and roll thing. It's just a good rock guitar. Oh, um, it's a beautiful rock guitar. It's perfectly suitable for that. Yeah. That's also that you know that none of my other friends know that. Even gearheads, they still don't they have no idea. It's just really? you got to really know your shit. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, Kramer's I, rad, dude. Yeah, hang on to it. Yeah, so um, now you said you and some of your friends started a record label recently, or in the last yeah. However, so um, any bands that you want to shout out from that label, and and if you can bridge that into what are your plans for the for the label? What are you doing, say, over the next six months to a year? Yeah, definitely. Um, We started California Street Music basically as a project with uh, Voodoo Glow Skulls out of uh, them trying to make some kind of plans for themselves as they're getting older to try and go yeah. more into the in- industry side while still playing the music. And uh, it was me, my dad, and Voodoo Glow Schools, um, George, Eddie, and Frank, um, the three brothers in the band. And we got together and put down a little business plan. We're like, hey, we're going to do this label. We want to work with friends. We want to start local, branch out, 
Um, we started off um, not just with Voodoo, but we picked up a band called Slow Children. Uh, they're a political post-hardcore band out of Riverside, California. Awesome dudes. Uh, Justice, Nathan, Mike, all they're all amazing guys with a really good amount of skill. And uh, we just released their second full length, um, Prevalent Emotional Distress. We got that available on CD now. We've got a vinyl pressing in the works right now. Uh, just a basic two variant. We got a black record, white record coming out for them. Um, stoked on having them on board. Um, we also have a band called The Penetrators, uh, who f features some members of the original Voodoo School, Glow Schools oh, lineup, nice. um, including George, who's their current bassist, is playing with them too. And they're kind of, I don't know how to describe them, they're kind of like an alternative rock with a punk vibe to them, mm -hmm. and they're really, really, really catchy. Um, I dig it a lot. Um, their first record is finished. Um, we're getting ready to mix, master, prep, get that released. And uh, who, who do you have working on the record? Uh, working on the record right now is Eddie Casillas, um, guitar player for Voodoo Glow Schools. Um, he has his own studio in Riverside, California called Dog Run Studios. And uh, just part of the whole keeping and the family supporting yeah, yeah. each other type of thing. So that's like Pull Prunch Prey. Um, they're kind of like uh, old school, black flag, off, circle jerk style, hardcore punk mm -hmm. band. Um, we've got their master, everything ready on that to go. We're pressing the CDs as we speak right now. And all that was recorded and mixed mastered by Eddie too. So we've been just kind of keeping it close knit and keeping in that same theme moving forward. Um, Voodoo Glow Schools is recording a 14 track LP right now. Um, it's going to be their first double album, which is going to be sick. <laughs> um, they're introducing some new styles on the album. They're integrating uh, some more reggae kind of sound. They're introducing some more of uh, the hardcore stuff to make it legit ska core, even though they've yeah. kind of grandfathered the ska core. But they're, they're, they're pushing hard on that right now. Um, we've got some other buddies um, that are Inland Empire base that Voodoo Glow Schools is kind of friends with um, that are kind of in the middle of swapping from a label to another that we're looking to pick up. Uh, can't really say a name yet on it, but okay. it'll be a pretty, pretty decent release. That's awesome. And, um, it's, it's somebody who gets frequent airplay across the country on alternative rock stations. Like, That's you, nice. you, you know who they are, so it's kind of cool. Um, Slow Children is working on a epic six-month-long tour right now, which I was planning with them Jeez. earlier today. And when yeah. they come back from that, they want to record an EP. Um, we're re-releasing, we have a band called Two Humans, which is local here out of Apple Valley. And uh, they released their de debut EP, uh, Metacognition, probably three months ago. And we scooped them up, and we're going to remix, remaster, re-release that. And they've also got another album already prepped, which is kind of cool. I heard some new songs from them last night. Um, for fans, weirdly enough, mix for fans of AFI and Maroon 5. <laughs> Dude, that's sick. I'm not going to lie. That's Dude, it's a really funky punk idea. album. It's yeah. a really funky punk album from what I've heard so far. And it's rad, but... Um, where you guys have so much going on with that label. Yeah, it's dude, awesome. it's gnarly. For having only seven bands on the roster, like we're we're pretty stacked right now. Yeah. We got a lot of stuff in the works, and gears are just cranking, and we're stoked on it right now, dude. Everybody's yes. super happy to be part of it. Yeah, you don't you don't know this about me, but growing up, uh, political punk and hardcore and ska, big time, were my favorite genres. That's what I really? listened to. Like, yeah, now I'm. I mean, I play in a pop punk band. But mm -hmm. there was a good period of time from, I guess, ages like 16 to 22 where I was like, no, nah, if it's not about, if it's not political, if it's not social, if it's not um, something harder or ska, that was the only thing I really could, you know, the poppiest it would go. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. I, I was all, that's what I was all about. And then I eventually broadened it back, my musical taste back out. But like mm -hmm. I can tell you, I mean, the amount of Voodoo Glow Skull songs that I had just from uh, the old Hopeless Records uh, comps, the Hopelessly Devoted to <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm old enough that I used to go to record or like CD stores because there was no iTunes. You couldn't find yeah. shit online, and you like nope, no, bands didn't have pages with their music just up. So you, yeah. I would just like scour these comps trying to find new bands and just buy as many as I could, like old Go Kart Records. Mm -hmm. uh, Hopeless, back when Hopeless's biggest band was Mustard Plug. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Back in the day when Hopeless yeah. was... Hopeless is making a strong comeback right now when it comes to the pop punk scene, but just related to the punk scene in general across all subgenres, 
Uh, Hopeless was massive back when they had yeah. like mustard plug and stuff like that going on. They were out of this package was another yes. big one. Yep, that was. I'm I'm not that old. I'm 21. But I still remember back before like uh, I used to go on pure volume and search for bands mm -hmm. all the time. And once I got tired of pure volume, I used to go to the warehouse records that we had in the next town over. It was probably like yeah. 40 minutes away, and I just buy like the old Punkarama CDs. Punkarama, and, fuck, that's yeah. the other comp I wanted to yeah. mention. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go. I've got a stack of those in my closet, probably somewhere. God, like that's, that's awesome. So many rad bands through that, like yeah. old the 30 songs for like five mouth. bucks. Yeah, oh, well, yeah, exactly. Yeah, that. Oh my. Well, yeah. Pennywise. So I also was uh, like skated a lot when I was a kid, um, nice. and uh, Pennywise was my go-to skate band until I discovered Less Than Jake. But like <laughs> that, those were just the most. It got me so amped up. Um, exactly. Um, oh, what was? Oh, so. Uh, oh, and Gutter Mouth. Um, so let me ask you this. Yeah. Do you know the Gutter Mouth record? Um, oh, what the fuck is it called? It's like my favorite one. Um. Uh. The one with the weird cartoon on the front, uh, Gusto. You know that record? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Dude, I haven't listened to that in a long time. What are okay? You see, I don't know if you remember what your take on the band hated it. It was my favorite Guttermouth record, and it wasn't close. And I was just curious if you, uh, if you're a big Guttermouth fan, uh, what what record you like the most? Um, I'm not a huge Guttermouth mm -hmm. fan, just because of. Some of the crowd they bring out to their shows and the way <laughs> yeah. their shows kind of get kind of well, get bad vibe. Yeah, exactly. They're lunatics. They bring all the crazies out. Dude, but they, they're did, good band. they did one of the um oh what show was it? Uh, it was a I forget the late, Kung Fu Records did a, a series of DVDs like Real Big Fish had a great one on there. Um, but it was called a series called The Show Must Must Go Off and uh -huh. Guttermouth did one. One of the worst performances I've ever heard. Even though I loved like all the songs, <laughs> terrible performance. Um. <laughs> And at one point, uh, their singer, Mark, somebody throws some pills on stage. And dude's so fucked up, he just goes down, picks up these mystery pills, and pops them in his mouth and swallows oh, yeah. them. It doesn't surprise me. <laughs> and I was watching the commentary that I guess they did the commentary like four or five years later, and he was kind of oh. more like, not completely straight, but he was more like on the straight and narrow at yeah. the time of the commentary. Used to be... And he was like, I gotta be honest, I kind of blacked out for this show. I have no idea what happened. And as he's watching that, he's like, Hey, what they just throw up there? Are those pills? Oh, that's funny. Wait, wait, what am I doing? What? Am I doing? No, no. <laughs> <laughs> what was I doing? That's, what was great. I <laughs> that's you awesome. You hear the dude have a live like wake up call. <laughs> he hit bottom <laughs> on the air. Like, oh shit. <laughs> oh man, I need to look that up now. Yeah, it's uh -oh. um, it's unbelievable. But uh, no, that's so cool. So you, like you said, you're not that old. Like you're only 21, but you still yeah. have the strong foundation of of punk roots. Um, yeah. I believe you said your your dad had a lot of roots to those scenes. Could you tell us about that? Yeah, definitely. Um, growing up, he was always in kind of like metal, generic punk bands in uh, the Orange County area, and he became a really big fan of Red Hot Chili Peppers. And like the reason he left the more bigger band he was ever in, which eventually morphed with like another band to become Motley Crue eventually. Oh my god. Um, yeah, there was like That's these sick. two bands like Aryan Rage and like Rock Candy and they combined to make Motley Crue, but like they're going to kick my dad out because he was the bass player and uh, <laughs> he loved Red Hot Chili Peppers. So he was doing slap bass like Flea and Funky Bass. Yeah. And, like, no, we can't do that. It's just like burr, 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 burr. just like <laughs> just generic whatever. Know, He's like, man. no, I can't do that. So he came real big fan of the Chili Peppers and ended up working for them for a little while, being their official photographer and graphic designer from like 1996 to about 2003. Oh my and, god, that's sick. Yeah, good time to do that too. Good yeah. era. <laughs> it was their it was their good era and. Working through that, uh, he ended up uh, becoming friends and working with uh, Jane's Addiction, um, Perry Farrell, and Dave Navarro, yeah. and also working with uh, Ian McKay of uh, Fugazi at the time and Minor Threat fame. So he was doing a lot of uh, graphic design stuff and work for Discord Records at the time. Oh, that's um, sick. Where, yeah, I, I have to dig it up sometime because now I've become a really big, not just Fugazi and everything Ian's related to and anything Rights of Springs related to type of fan. I'm just kind of engulfed more of the Discord genre, I guess, just their kind of brand on the punk take. Yeah. And I need to look up what stuff he exactly did. But I remember when I was probably like 10, Ian was like trying to get our family to move out to DC for my dad to be in house for uh, Discord back in the day. And wow. 
Like, we didn't end up doing it. Like, it was too big of a deal to uproot from California and move out to D.C. and try and see how that went. When it, could, it could have been cool, but um, he's just kind of always been in the music scene and has always known people and met people here and there. And it's really weird because, like, his main thing that he does is BMX bikes and action sports and punk music kind of go together. Oh, they much. absolutely and do. It's, have it's... for a while. And, like, that's how I met Voodoo Glow Schools is... Uh, they have a clothing line called BMX Punks where they do parody t-shirts of like Dead Kennedys and Black oh, Flag cool. and add BMX stuff and they've got like little skanker ska dudes wearing like a BMX helmet on shirts and oh, that's stuff sick. Like that. yeah, they make cool stuff and like their kids all ride BMX and like that's how the guitar thing got started is they ride our the Supercross BMX frames and they came to us like man it'd be really cool if somebody made guitars as good as you make bikes and my dad's hmm. like, well, let's try it. Let's see what happens. Yeah, why not? Sure. Yeah, exactly. So we made a couple, uh, like, basically modified Telecasters with, like, Swamp Ash bodies, Seymour Duncan pickups, uh, active pickups, just a, a basic, cool guitar, and had them painted bright green, like, voodoo colors. And we gave them to yeah. them to try out, and they're like, oh, my gosh, these are sick. You have to make more. So that's, that's so what cool. we've kind of been doing. But uh, Dude, it's pretty cool. Awesome. Yeah, and well, so just, a lot yeah. of cool people. So just to unpack some of that real quick. Yeah. So I don't know, do you listen to Matt Pryor from the Get Up Kids? you ever listen to his podcast, uh, Nothing to Write Home About? Um, I've listened to it a couple times before. It's definitely on my list because I've been trying to listen to podcasts more at work while I'm working now instead of music. Yep, and that's what I do. Yeah, it's on my list of stuff that I need to go back and catch up on because I remember listening to a couple episodes and then I was like, ah, oh, this is cool, and then just completely falling off the wagon for some yeah, reason. That, that, that <laughs> app, I do that with various podcasts from time to time. Well, so he talks about Discord records all day long. Ooh, nice. Like they're like it feels like every couple, it feels like they they reference that every you know four or five episodes, especially when um. When uh, the uh, uh, James Deweese from Reggie and Get Up Kids is on, okay, um, yeah, yeah, understandable. He also, he also has always mentions, oh, um, I'm looking for you know anybody who wants to be on my podcast. If you're in an up and coming band, I've of course emailed him. Um, nice. And uh, yeah, yeah, we went back and forth a little bit. I don't think he was interested, but that's okay. I'll live. <laughs> oh, heavyweight um, is rat, but come on. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, well, he's he's everyone. Um, well, my a friend of mine, our producer, um, plays drums for the singer of Punchline solo project, Blue of Colors, and they okay. went on tour opening up for Matt Pryor. And mm. so the joke on tour was he's old man Pryor. He's always grumpy. He hates what the kids are doing. <laughs> like, it's funny because that's totally me to a T. But anyway, um, <laughs> but so because of your like the things that you could mention with your dad and what you're doing now. Mm -hmm. um, you should definitely just hit him up on Facebook or via email. See if you can get on and tell some that. stories. Like you really, I he sounds really interesting. Um, well, thank you for the suggestion. I appreciate oh, yeah, that. Absolutely. I would have had no idea. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. Well, you know, so here's here's something funny. You mentioned the Chili Peppers and Dave Navarro specifically. So uh -huh. as you know, my last name my last name is Navarro. Yeah. Um, my middle name is Dave. Oh. And that's uh, my name would have been Dave Navarro pre his fame like in 86 uh -huh. when I was born, uh -huh. um, but my Uncle Eric passed away shortly before I was born, so they named me after him, put it as my middle name. Um, okay. so, so my dad at the same time um, from, I guess my dad was in L.A. as a session musician. Like mm -hmm. uh, Someday I need to get the list of things he's done, but it's like every once in a while I hear some like, classic rock or like 80s song on, on uh, the radio, and he's like, oh yeah, that, I did the rhythm for that. I did the like whatever, okay. like... Yeah, he was working for all the big labels and stuff. That's um, cool. And he's got cool stories just about like all the like iconic people he got to meet. So, but anyway, um, he uh, because at the time there were only three Navarros in the um, in the the musicians directory or whatever that is, like the as uh, yeah. uh, the registration of I don't know the SAG version the music version of SAG. Yeah, um, yeah. And so uh, there was Lo the no Navarro from Lowen and Navarro, my dad, and um, and Dave Navarro. And mm -hmm. at the, like as the Chili Peppers started to get big, my dad kept getting, has the story, he keeps getting phone calls from Dave Navarro's drug dealers <laughs> <laughs> trying, to, trying to locate him so they can, oh, they can meet him and, and, and to make some deliveries. <laughs> and, uh, and it just got to a point where like he developed a rapport with these people. Uh, from what I gathered, I didn't really have to. Nice. I hope I'm not embellishing too much, but I remember that was the the story. But like, I was like, no, that's the 
Wrong, wrong, Navarro. I'll, yeah, I'll yeah. forward you. No, um, that's awesome. But uh, so that's really cool that you have that background. How would you say? Uh, I don't know if you've even necessarily given this too much thought, but um, mm -hmm. how how do you feel like that having your dad in that environment affected you growing up? Oh, absolutely, completely huge. I'm from what I assume from my life now, like. I'm I'm a big music nerd. Like my life pretty much revolves in circles around music. I mean, you walk in my room, and the first thing you see against my one wall is I literally right now I'm looking <laughs> at it as I'm sitting here. I have a pair of JBL monitors right here uh, disconnected. A pair of the Pioneer replicas of those disconnected. Oh my God. Two gigantic Polk towers. A pair of Canton German speakers and Polk monitors, and then I've got two turntables set up, a Nakamichi cassette deck, and three receivers all sitting on a giant shelf being system that's full of vinyl. Like, that's beautiful. <laughs> that, that's, yeah, and then I've got vinyl on the wall and band banners and all that fun stuff. But it's, I think the music I was listening to and the environment I was in when I was younger completely influenced who I am now. Um, I don't think my life would be as robust as it is now without having music involved. Um, I, I was always the nerdy dorky kid in school. I was like five foot eleven when I was in fifth grade, and I would yeah. wear jean shorts that were basically like short shorts and glasses, and I got straight A's on everything. So I was the big nerd dork. Didn't have many friends, like. Without, that's so interesting. I, that's the that's the road that you took because you've got. It sounds like you're, from the people your dad knew, it's like there's the party and the rock, the rock and roll and the punk stuff. Mm -hmm. um, I guess party, like, like, but there's more like um, there's more of a culture and a lifestyle that's more out there. And yeah, exactly. To, a, to an outsider, it looks kind of cool and badass. Uh -huh. um, really went like the the bookworm type. That's that's interesting. Yeah, that was that was me growing up completely. Like I was the kid who played Pokemon cards and had my Game Boy and brought my Game Boy to school and would play Bard's Tale and Oregon Trail on the computers at school by figuring out how to get around the internet firewalls. <laughs> and like Well that's like a that's modern day punk. <laughs> yeah exactly. <laughs> that's that's how I was. I didn't do any sports. Like I didn't party in high school like I, I was still not a drinker never was a drinker then mm -hmm. but um, I think without having music as an influence in my life it would be a lot different than it is now I think I'd be a lot more reserved in certain ways and not have as many different interests and have so wait, so would you say like, music kind of was it seems like you were kind of introverted based on how you're yeah. describing yourself yeah. so would you say music kind of forced you out of that comfort zone and made you talk to people because you were so excited about it or yeah completely like I music was music was definitely the thing to like break down shells like I still have problems like talking to people sometimes like I went and saw Basement two weeks ago and I'm friends with Alex their guitarist but I'd never talked to any of the other guys before. Mm -hmm. And I was hanging out with Alex after the show. And he's like, oh, let me go get the rest of the guys. I literally stood there for like 15, 20 minutes before I even attempted to talk to any of the other dudes in the oh, basement. Wow. Just because like, yeah. I, don't, I, I have a problem talking and connecting to people um, unless it's on a musical thing. And then I kind of look up to those guys too. So it's kind of a combination of things. Yeah, that can be rough <laughs> when you're just like, oh, you guys are so awesome. It's really... Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but um, I, I went to shows when I was little with my dad, like on Chili Pepper stuff. And then throughout middle school, high school, pretty much didn't see anything until like maybe 2008, 2009. And I went and saw um, this super group called Spirits in the Sky, which was a, it was a super group comprised of Dave Navarro um, from Jane's Addiction Chili Pepper fame. And then Billy Corgan of Smashing Pumpkins. Oh my god, so and far like so members, good. Yeah, members of Strawberry <laughs> Alarm Clock. And what they would play was Smashing Pumpkins songs and... Um, they played some Strawberry Alarm Clocks covers, and they played some covers by The Seeds, because it was kind of a dedication to Sky Saxon, who just passed away. And it was kind of like a psychedelic type of thing. It was out in the middle of the desert, um, out towards 29 Palms, California, and it was on outdoor patio, and it was probably 100 people like in this small little outdoor patio at this little honky-tonk bar, <laughs> and with amazing 
rock legends on the yeah, stage. That's unbelievable. And it was cool, and that kind of sparked a little bit, like, I want to go and do more things, because, like, I I'm still don't get to get out of the house that much, but it, like, sparked, like, okay, I want to go see this show, go see this show. Yeah. And that's how I ended up meeting a lot of cool people. Like, the first time I saw Slow Children, who's on our label, was they played with Guttermouth at a steakhouse out in here in Apple Valley, but, like, mm-hmm. out towards, like, the Boonie area, and... Uh, so, just so I can get a, a feel for it, how far do you... What major cities are near you, and how far away do you live from them? Um, I'm two and a half hours south of Vegas and two hours north of L.A. Okay, okay. So... Um, well, so, yeah, so the... the uh, okay, so, so I have this weird... So I got this weird thing. I've, my whole life... Um, it's funny, you, like, you talked to your family almost transplanted to D.C. when my dad made... was you know, successful enough to have his own label and he was putting his own records out, we moved to, around to D, near D.C. Nice. <laughs> and so, uh, so when, um, so I was born in L.A. and then I guess I moved back here when I was five mm-hmm. and I grew up here and it was very strange because once I started, like the only places I've ever wanted to go, I never really cared for bars or clubs. I loved going to shows. That's where I wanted to go. I'd go to a bar or club for a show, obviously, but yeah. That's where I go. It's still to this day. It's the only place I really spend my money. Just go to shows. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, and so, but I've had a weird experience with both music and comedy because those are two shows I love to go to. Mm. Uh, where every every show is like, I mean, I'm 45 minutes from DC or 30 minutes from DC. You got 9:30 Club, an iconic venue, Black Cat, an iconic venue, uh-huh. and then a dozen or two dozen bars and smaller clubs that you go see shows at. Then 30 minutes, 20 minutes north of me, you got Baltimore. I got legendary mm-hmm. venues like the Auto Bar, the Wrecker that used to exist, and then uh, now Rams Head Live and a handful of other places. Every show I've ever been to, even if there's two people there, is at like an iconic venue or a great club or like and then I talk to people in other states and they're like, "Oh yeah, I saw a place a, an amazing band at a, at a steak at a steakhouse or at an yeah. eight, like a Chinese restaurant yeah. or like somebody's basement." We don't have basement shows here because, well, I mean, we do very rarely, but the the, uh-huh. the, the clubs and bars are all there, and they're trying, they're desperately trying to fill their nights with bands. Well, that's so good. What's it, like, what's it? Yeah, and it's it's cool, but the problem becomes you're now having to travel for every show. You have to like go into the city to do a show. Mm-hmm. You have to find parking. It's usually more expensive. Everything is more expensive because there's a city. Um, so sometimes, like, uh, it's it's hard to, to find the balance between, oh, great, we have these awesome, like, I guess, aesthetics and sound and, like, sound systems, mm-hmm. but it feels like the heart isn't necessarily there because it all feels, like, constructed. But yeah, then I hear yeah. people in other in other states talk about all these, like, amazing, like, you can, you, the, the band sounds like a wall of noise in a basement or a restaurant, but mm-hmm. everyone's still, there's just this energy. Do you find... Like, how do you find the difference between when you drive out a couple hours to go see a show at, like, a really well-established venue versus, mm. say, like, a hometown show where it's just everyone going <laughs> ape shit in a basement? Um, it's, it's interesting here in California, especially where I live. In Apple Valley, uh, we technically do not have a single venue, bar, club, nothing that puts wow. on shows up here yeah. anymore. And uh, we have house shows and stuff. Um, it's... It's kind of an interesting contrast, and I'll I'll do two different comparisons because um, going to, diff- to any kind of a dive place or going to an iconic venue is a little bit of a drive for me. And the first comparison I'll make is between a Chain Reaction, which is in Anaheim, California, and the Roxy, which is on Sunset Strip in uh, West mm-hmm. Hollywood. And both are about the same distance from me. And uh, I'll go to Chain. Chain will be real basic. You wait in their line. They you show them a ticket. You get in no re-entry, they have a little patio for smoking, and it's a room that holds 250 people, maybe, and you'll have a local band, like, good example, The Sheds, mm-hmm. who are... Who I just played with last oh, month. Nice, <laughs> awesome, good dudes, Mac and Morgan are rad. Um, I got a funny have, shit story after you tell me this. <laughs> nice, awesome. Um, but we'll, they'll, The Sheds will play a Chain Reaction as, like, an opener, and the entire... It's a small group, but the entire venue will go off like kids crowd surfing stage diving climbing up the walls like it goes nuts it gets hot and sweaty like the walls are dripping it's gross but it's awesome and then you go to the Roxy and I was just at the Roxy not that long ago to see the Man Overboard tour with Transit Forever Came Calling and Knuckle Puck and you go into the Roxy and you've got big security guards everybody's checking you walk in you've got a long wait to get in the doors 
Um, it's very sterile inside, um, very controlled environment. Um, anybody who stage surfed, anybody who cr um, did uh, any stage dives was kicked out of the venue. Oh, wow. Um, it was different, and uh, because of... That sounds more like some of the venues that I play. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, because of that, I really, really don't want to go back to the Roxy for a show unless it's something where, like, okay, I know I'm not going to see that band anywhere else for a long time, so I'll go see them at the Roxy. But, like, otherwise, I'll choose Chain Reaction any day, or, like, Cobalt Cafe in Canoga Park, California is like that, or Che Cafe in San Diego is like that, where it's just a small room where they're doing their best to get whoever in and play, and, like, everybody goes off for whoever. Everybody's super supportive, whatever bands. I, I believe I've seen, I've seen YouTube videos, grainy YouTube videos from 12 years ago of Against Me playing there. That's the only time I've ever seen anything from, oh, from nice. that venue. Um, uh, unless I, uh, assuming I'm thinking of the right venue, but yeah, yeah. Yeah, it would make sense, but... Um, and then what's really weird, too, is, like, how shows up here is kind of... It's kind of a mixed bag, depending on who's hosting it. I try not to do any house shows anymore because it's a very drama-filled environment in the high desert. Um, but you'll go to certain house shows to where it's somebody who is, like, professionally rented out a PA system and is holding it in a garage, and they've got a security guard that they've hired, and it all seems pretty organized and strict, and you're there to watch the music and stand around and watch, and that's basically it. And that's... The way some of the house shows are starting to get up here because there's been too much drama, the crazy ones. But then you go to shows like the one, the one that happened two weeks ago, and this is kind of my reason why I want to stop going to house shows up here, is um, it got real packed in this grungy little beat-down house where these band dudes live, and they brought all these bands in uh, from like San Diego and from L.A. and locally to play this house show. And no control on drugs, no control on alcohol. And uh, it was mainly a hardcore show, and then a band that's on my label, Two Humans, was playing, and they're kind of like a psych rock, prog rock, mm -hmm. indie rock kind of band. They didn't exactly fit in, and they're on stage, and like all these dudes from not our local scene, but from like San Diego and L.A., uh, were coming on stage and pushing the guitarist and pushing the bassist. Jeez, what? And uh, it reached a point to where the one guy reached down, grabbed the singer's water bottle, and started drinking from it and sat it back down, and then picked up the mic stand and threw it back at him in his face. And busted his lip, like, bent his nose, nose is bleeding, and they all stopped playing, and the bassist uh, dropped his bass and was like, hey, you need to leave the stage. Yeah. And a bunch of other guys in the crowd were like, we're not leaving, we're not leaving, we came out from San Diego to see this. And literally, like, 20, 30 guys got on stage and tried to fight the band. And the band's like, yeah, we're done. Grabbed their instruments, packed up, walked off the stage, we're done. And uh, I guess cops ended up being called like 20 minutes later because another fight escalated between the same dude who incited or tried to incite the fight on stage and another group of people that were there. And by the way, of um, course it did. It had nothing to do with the band. Or no, the style it had nothing to do with the band. Like Assholes who were yeah. trying to pick a fight with whoever they can pick a fight with. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. And like the dude is the dude's a lead singer for a hardcore band, notorious now for doing this type of stuff in the three little cities we have over here: Apple Valley, Victorville, and Hesperia. And like, it's ridiculous. Like, why everybody in the scene up here, our scene so small, and we don't have any venues or anything, should be supporting each other um, with what everybody's trying to do? But no, this dude's that's the lead singer of another band that could possibly play with this band again is the one who goes on stage and throws the mic stand yeah, and the mic insane. in the other singer's face. Like, what the heck, dude? It's, it's crazy it's to see that in such a, especially in a smaller scene. So, uh, I don't remember if, no, this wasn't on air, but uh, Caitlin Drummond, who we had on the Babe Talk last week, uh -huh. uh, she and I were just having a side conversation, I guess, like the day before. Mm -hmm. And, um, and we were both like, I'm not going to you know, go into too much detail, but we were both basically having complaints about our own personal scene and kind of just you know, sympathizing yeah. with each other. And she said something to me um, about uh, just somebody basically having a big ego. And I mm. just had this thought, and I was just like, how funny is it that people in a local scene have such big, like they get so greedy when it comes to money and so egotistical when it comes to fame and success when there's so little money or success in it at all. Exactly, <laughs> like, and that's like up like here. Very... You've got no, you've got, there's very little chance of potential 
of doing anything that's kind of outside of a hundred mile radius of here. And we used to have two bands, and our our genre up here basically is hair metal core. And we used to have two bands who were very dominant, as in we need to play every show, um, pushing merch out like crazy, being very egotistical, like, oh, your band's not good, you can't play with us. Um, just big, big old hotheads. And luckily those dudes aren't around anymore because the scene kind of wisened up and was like, hey, if you're going to exclude us, like, that's not cool, so we that don't want to work with you about in general. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's a year, and then people know. Trust me, I see it every year. The it, douchebags who get all this like initial success, eventually word gets out, and then you're like, oh, yeah, no. Get, get that. <laughs> exactly, and like the reason they were kind of popular at first with the one band is um, they had a guitar player um, who was the son of a very, very, very famous uh, heavy metal drummer, and everybody was kind of riding on the coattails of that a little bit. And then he ended up leaving and uh, working with another band just because of inner drama and musical direction. And the band started working with some other dudes. And kind of after that, like their egos were already high because they got all these press on like different metal sites and different metal blogs and reviews and all this stuff. So they, they were riding their high horses hardcore. And then that guy, the guitarist, left. <laughs> and um, they still tried to push their way into things and still try to be dominant, and everybody's like, eh, no. And it lasted for probably about a year and a half, two years, and uh, I was actually talking to one of my friends yesterday. We went and scoped out um, a new bar that has a stage and a 500-square-foot area of, like, dance floor um, to try and hold shows there. Nice. And I was like, oh, what happened? What's up with this band? Like, what's going on with that? And he's like, yeah, they don't exist anymore. <laughs> of course and I was they like, do. what? And he's like, yeah, the one guy left because this. And the one guy was like, well, I don't want to work with you anymore because I deserve more than this. And they just kind of dissolved. Oh, my God. But, yeah, yeah. yeah, our local scene's weird. It's interesting. <laughs> it's, a, all the, it's so cool to see the different dynamics of these scenes and... Yeah, no, that's that's really cool. Ours is sep definitely separated by genre, but even in within each genre, because um, there's so many bands, it's such a densely populated area. Yeah, that, like um, it's uh, I think I've talked about this before on my own podcast, but there's a mm -hmm. double-edged sword. Is that the bands, like the 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 sheer number of say, let's just take pop punk. In my scene, there are maybe six pop punk bands, maybe more, maybe like ten that mm -hmm. you in California would have heard of. Mm -hmm. Like that's like there's so like that many like that have you know put themselves out there enough to get heard about. Um, but then in addition to that, you got another like 20, 30 bands who are also really, really good, and then another 20, 30 bands who probably suck. <laughs> but like yeah, it happens. <laughs> but in, you get you get like a, a you know you know a 30, 30 mile radius or forty mile radius, and you get you know, 80 bands in the genre, 70, 80 bands that I can think of off the top of my head in the genre, exactly. all playing all these shows, and so you end up having so many, like, I don't like to think of music as a competition, but the truth is, the more, like, the, there are limited spaces for how many people can play shows, or how many people, how many bands somebody's really going to listen to, mm -hmm. so it causes, like, a little competition in the sense of, you're trying to make the best music you can, and when you have other people in your town making the same type of music, you try to make better music. And, exactly. Uh, the whole double-edged sword thing, on one end, every other, every other month, or even every month, there's another pop-punk, punk, or ska release in my local area that's really good. Mm -hmm. But on the other side, it's hard to have a cohesive scene when there are so many musicians and not enough quote-unquote fans that ah. like, everything's spread out so much. If yeah. there's only like you know twenty pop punk bands, the pop punk kids are gonna go to every show. Pop punk kids already do go to every show, but they yeah. can't go to a show like they can go to four shows a week <laughs> to see mm -hmm. all the local bands. Yeah. Um, do you find that's different in your area where I assume there are fewer bands in those uh, genres? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, within fifty miles, we have two groups you could technically classify as pop punk. Technically, oh um, we have Forever Came Calling and Family Thief. And I actually believe Malcolm from Family Thief is now uprooted and lives in San Diego. So we've got Forever Came Calling, and they don't play like locally here in Apple Valley, Victorville. We're kind of a little bit out of their area, somewhat. But within like a 50 mile radius, that's it. But when you start getting into more metal genres, when you're talking metalcore, mm -hmm. when you're talking grindcore, um, 
Um, what else? We've got all kinds of different genres I've never heard of, like Nintendo Core, whatever the heck that Chip is. Chiptune ish. Yeah, uh, or it's like core. Chiptune and put Grindcore together, so you get like guttural screaming dude, and like dude, zombie. Dude. <laughs> oh my god! So about three years ago, me and the old rhythm guitarist in my band, who's no longer with, uh, well, he's alive. He's no longer with our band. He's, he's <laughs> okay. With us. I'm glad he's um, alive. Yeah, exactly. It's good. We yes, um, it's alive and well. Uh, <laughs> but he and I had this joke. We were like, uh, it was right after. So I guess it's 2011, 2012, uh-huh. where dubstep is really start. I mean, it's been peaking for about a year at that point. Yeah. And so we were like, what's like the most ridiculous genre that we can make? Because I'm pretty good at uh, digital music, so I can figure out how to make all that stuff. Uh-huh. Um, and after I had learned how to make dubstep and chiptune, after hearing about those. We're like, all right, let's brainstorm the craziest band we can think of, and we wanted to make it, um, uh, we wanted to make it grindcore, chip step, <laughs> okay. and, um, and so what we would do is, and I still have it all mapped out. I just need to, you know, put pen to paper and make this happen. Uh-huh. Was we were gonna, um, we were gonna have, uh, like, the record was gonna start with a, well, I'm a little bit country. And I'm a little bit rock and roll, and then have me scream just, well, I'm a little bit dubstep, and then just <laughs> grindcore guitars screaming over dubstep beats. Oh, man. And, and then we were going to have, like, a quick little break after, like, 20 seconds of it, like, when, you know, we're normally it'd be, like, a quick break, and then it would go back into some heavy chugging. During yeah. the break, we'd have, like, a lone solitary air horn blow just a little too long, and then a <laughs> fleet of, like, 20 air horns come in, and then oh, it just gosh. drops, bit, the, the bass drops, and then just more, Dude. just go, 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 go. <laughs> Dude, you need to do that. There's this record label in Philly <laughs> that's called Nog Records, and uh, the guy who runs it, Pori, um, he's kind of specialist in weird genres and like he's a yeah. big Nintendo core guy right now and he's a big like that's what he's into is he releases like he does everything on cassette and floppy disks <laughs> floppy of course floppy yeah, you gotta take it to the dollars they're four dollars or you can get um, five tapes for ten bucks and it's just the weirdest random you'll get an album yeah. that's just like static and like records like being scratched and then you'll get something where it's like Somebody's literally playing like NES Legend of Zelda, and you've got a <laughs> screaming on top of it. You got chuggy bass lines going, and you just hear like the the little eight bit like Zelda yeah. music going <laughs> on in the background. <laughs> exactly, <laughs> exactly. And they release it on cassette. And this dude's probably done like sixty releases now in the past year. Wow. It's just all random stuff, and he ends up selling out of this stuff. He'll like make fifty cassettes, and they'll be gone in yeah. like a month and a half. And it's just weirdo stuff, like something that's just, I'd buy it because I'm like, oh, what the heck is that? Yeah, what like, the, what the is this? Let's do it. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. I'll spend $4 on this. Let's see what this sounds like. And yeah. it's interesting. <laughs> but yeah, our, our, our genres up here are kind of weird. But when you start going to the metal scene, we've probably got like eh, two, three that are decent. And then you've got like 30 that are absolutely horrible, and yeah. then they overlap shows on purpose, and uh, then, like, four <laughs> people will come out to the one show, and then, like, 15 people will come out to the other show, mm-hmm. and then there's, like, 20, 30 kids who are like, I couldn't decide what show to go to, so I went to Denny's, and, <laughs> <laughs> like, that's how it is, like, yeah. it's ridiculous, man. <laughs> Man, that's crazy. That's so cool. Thank you for telling me about that scene. Like, that's really yeah, interesting. Not a um, problem, man. You can see all the weird stuff that happens here in in the desert of Southern California. No, that's, well, when I saw that that the No Room for Warp, uh, No Room for Warp Tour, No Room for Rock Stars Warp Tour yeah. documentary, and saw um, just Forever Came Calling talking about not necessarily that area, but the area like just areas like that out west. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's just so interesting, and you mentioned Motley Crue way before. I'm in the middle of reading their uh, The Dirt book. Oh, and, sweet! Um, yeah, and they uh, and just hearing them, th- they're a band that, for whatever it's worth, I'm definitely not a fan of. But yeah, me man, either. Will I? I will read any crazy rock star story. I eat that oh. shit up. Yeah, <laughs> dude. Like I, I can dig that stuff too. And I knew the book came out, and I, I haven't had much time to read lately. But it's definitely something I want to check out because I've read some books in the past, um, namely 
if you've ever read uh, Scar Tissue. I have I not. I knew you were going to say Scar yeah, Tissue. Yep. Yeah, Anthony Kiedis' uh, little autobiography slash biography. That it's, it's nuts. And then there's another book that's just dropped um, that I'm really good friends with, the guy who wrote it, uh, D.H. Pellegro who was mm -hmm. the drummer for the Dead Kennedys. Dead Kennedys, yeah, oh yeah, I know, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and uh, he wrote a book that's an autobiography on all his different stories. Um, Are you he, serious? Yeah, he just dropped that probably like two, three months ago. Do you know what the, and, what the book's called? Um, I'm trying to think right now. It's You know, it doesn't matter, I'm just going to Google it. I'm going to buy this while we're doing this. That's Sweet, happening. I think it's called Dreadnought, let me check. It's like Yeah, it is, it is. Okay. The king of Afropunk. Yep, oh, king of Afropunk. Oh, sick. It's it's really. Oh cool. well, I just bought it on Kindle. Sweet. <laughs> You'll enjoy it. I had um a kind of rough draft version of it, probably like five or six years, and there's some stories in there that's... that my dad, when he was reading through it the first time, was like, "You can't say these things about Anthony Kiedis in a book." And DH is like, yeah. "Why? Why can't I say it?" That's what happened. And my dad's like, Chili Peppers aren't going to be stoked on that information getting out. Okay. He's just like, I don't care. This is my story. Like, the, I've heard yeah. so many different crazy stuff from that guy and then, like, reading his book and everything, too. And I know they're trying to do a um, – We I think we talked about this on Babe Talk before, um, the kind of different movies that are the stories of rock stars. Like, they're doing yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. they're doing all those right now. It seems to be the thing right now. But they're trying to do a movie adaptation of Dreadnought right now, too. Oh, and um, that sick. that could be nuts if that happens. Like there, it, any, it, <laughs> yeah. So yeah, any any of those. I think we're finally at the point where I know this is happened with superhero movies, where the stuff that I I always really loved is now being taken seriously and is mm -hmm. extremely popular. And just I remember growing up, this is uh, uh, just a perfect way to sum up how I feel about the way popular culture is going or how it's how it's going right. Um, uh -huh. I guess I would have been maybe 11 to 13 or 11 to 14 when the Backstreet Boys and NSYNC and all those, the boy bands was, yeah, was really yeah. big. Um, or today, I guess. <laughs> seemed to all be coming back. Um, but uh, I remember MTV at the time, you know, it was nothing but music. I mean, every once in a while it would be another show. And so... Um, they had they would have entire like days dedicated to oh in sync is going to host for 6 hours and share their favorite videos of all time and mm -hmm. i remember just being like how fucking cool is that that would it be like j just to have like i was like i remember i wish or i remember thinking i wish i liked what was popular i wish wow. the shit i liked could be on TV eight hours a day and could yeah. have movies made about it and the stories uh -huh. could be told and books could be written. And now, thanks to the internet and thanks to pop culture changing drastically over... Uh -huh. Like, the nerds won. We won the yeah. culture war. Oh, yeah. Like, we, did, we demolished, like, <laughs> everybody else. Like, we, we went... Marvel we movies are performing, I mean... Yeah. Yeah. No, you can't, you can't beat it. And so that's why it's so cool that the idea that's anything... And I know his, his career in life expands far beyond the Dead Kennedys. That was a band that was existed for, what, five years, maybe? Dude, they're still um, kicking. He's on tour right now. Oh, oh I should clarify. <laughs> in my heart, in the your heart, that I know and love existed. Uh -huh. Yeah, my, um... Yeah, Jello's gone, and Jello's... This sounds, this sounds so made up. A friend of mine who I play Magic the Gathering with, his uh -huh. second cousin is uh, was their singer for a while. Oh, um, that's from, cool. I guess the... Early two thousand. I don't know when he started, but I guess he was only recently replaced in the last four or five years. Yeah, they they um, got a new singer probably like five years ago. So. Yeah, yeah, it was yeah. So he was, and it was funny because we knew each other for years, and he knew Dead Kennedys was one of my favorite bands, my favorite band, like for a good long period of my life. Uh -huh. And um, and uh, he he never told me because he was embarrassed oh. because he thought he was like, oh, he's gonna be mad at me because <laughs> like, I don't care, but um. But I know, like, so I know his his career ex and life extends beyond that. But it's still mm -hmm. like that's the idea that anything Dead Kennedys related could be made into a movie, a, a biography, any of that shit, yeah. like, just blows my mind it's and crazy. makes me so excited. Dude, it would make me so happy if that happens because not only does it bring 
uh, the most, one of the most instrumental punk acts of all time that kind of helped develop the shape and sound of what we have now to the big screen. But um, he was with Chili Peppers for a while, too, and he did the Mother's Milk album, and he did some other stuff with them, too, before he ended up being kicked out of the band um, for some different reasons. And uh, he's now the guitarist for a heavy metal band called Pelegro. Oh, yeah. Well, okay. wow, and, like... That. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's actually when we started working with him as he was doing Pelegro, and he was a heavy metal vocalist slash guitarist. And it's not bad. It's actually pretty good. You would never expect the Dirty yeah. would be able to do this. But um, that's when we started working. And he's worked with some other people, too. Like, he worked with Reverend Horton, Horton Heat for a little bit. Oh, wow. And he's worked with Nail Bomb, which was kind of like an industrial death metal band from Europe. And he's he's done a lot of interesting stuff in his life. Like, he's... He's a dude that you could sit down with at like a bar and get a couple of drinks with and end up being there for like five hours because yeah. DH is just going to go on with his awesome epic stories forever. And now you can have it in a, a little book form and see a little bits and pieces <laughs> of <the> crazy. <laughs> awesome. All right, so it is, we've done about an hour, which is usually what I do with the interviews. I could talk to you yeah. for hours and hours. That's why you're the <laughs> first of all the Babe Talk people like I want to get everybody on, but you're the hands down the first that I wanted to. Like well, when we, after, you. yeah, absolutely. Well, after this week, I was like, well, I was gonna ask you guys like later down the line, but I was like, I gotta get Lincoln on now. Like I just wanna. Nice. And part of why I wanted you on now is I would love for you to, um, uh, if you wanna, uh, pro, I, I was glad to have you tell uh, tell us about everything that you've you've been up to and hype some bands and your label. Um, but I definitely want to give you another another outlet. Uh, to hype your comp that's coming out for a really good oh, cause. Okay. And so well, before we leave, yeah. if you wouldn't mind uh, plugging that, I would love to uh, love yeah. to hear you tell everybody about it. Definitely. So I've been working on this comp for a couple months now. Um, it all started, uh, my best friend Andrew, he's had constant back problems for the past about two years. And it started to get to a point where uh, it was hard for him to get out of the bed in the morning and hard for him to walk and hard for him to go to work. And... Uh, Ended up going into the hospital and telling him, oh, you got a narrow spine. Like, if anything else goes wrong, like, come back to the emergency room and giving him a list of everything that was going wrong. He's like, screw this. Goes home, goes to sleep, wakes up in the morning. Can't move his lower body at all. Um, rush him down to Loma Linda, which is the big university hospital um, down the hill from here in the Inland Empire. And they do a scan, and they're like, oh, you have Cauda Equina syndrome. Like, how long has this been going on? And he's like, well, I've been unable to use most of my lower body for, like, two weeks. And they're like, oh, well, this should have been operated on within 72 hours. Oh, my it had God. Been, yeah, it had been too long. They're like, we'll do the surgery. We'll see what happens. And he went under the knife, ended up having two discs taken out of his spine um, to relieve pressure. Because what it was is the two discs had bulged and we're pressing on the Cauda Equinda nerve bundle at the bottom of your spine, which controls all your uh, nerves and muscles in your lower body. So they did that, um, did it uninsured. Um, he's on leave from work. He can't return to work because his job requires lifting over 50 pounds. He's not supposed to lift more than 5 pounds now. He's on a walker. His wife had to uh, leave work to take care of him. They've got a 1-year-old son, and, like, man, what can I do to help them get along a little bit easier and to pay for his medical bills and take care of all that? And I was like, you know what? Let, let's, get, let's get the musical buddies together and see what we can, we can knock out. So I uh, started the Cotty Quinn Benefit compilation and talked to some old friends, made some new friends along the way, and we're going to do this benefit album that's going to uh, pretty much directly benefit uh, Andrew Cole and his wife Amanda and his son Aiden and help them get through what they're going going through right now, and uh, Andrew's also chosen to donate 10% to the Loma Linda Children's uh, University Hospital Foundation uh, to help support what they do and the people that made his life a little bit easier and probably saved him from being paralyzed. And uh, first people I went to, Forever Came Calling. Forever Came Calling is going to have a rad song in the compilation. Uh, Handguns has been real cool dudes. Talk to Brandon. Brandon's contributing a song. Uh, Mariel from Candy Hearts has a song for us. Um, Drew from I Call Fives has contributed a song. On My Honor has contributed a song from Beyond the Grave. Um, just before they broke up, they sent us over a nice little track. Uh, Modern Baseball, Brendan Lukens has been an awesome dude. 
and uh, we're supposed to be getting a special super secret modern baseball song that you're going to exclusively have on this compilation and uh, we're going we're going to get some other cool stuff we're working with some uh, bands back east we're working with a place and time uh, we're working with oh, I didn't know Place and Time was on there. Yeah, Place and Time's on it. Yeah, Joel, Joel, he 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 kicked it down nice for that. We have a brand new Place and Time song that's, that's fresh awesome. out the studio. Yeah, and uh, so there's cool. a chance I might also have it. <laughs> <laughs> nice, awesome. And no, those like, those dudes are like our brothers. But yeah, oh, sorry, keep going, keep going. Dudes, yeah. I just got really excited that they're You're on good, there. man. Yeah, Place and the new song so good too. I was super stoked when I heard it because the last thing I heard was their split EP they did. And he sent me the new song, and I was like, oh, this is going to be good. Like, this is going to help East Coast scene a bunch. This is going to be awesome. Yeah, wait till um, you hear the whole, the whole EP. It's oh, you're getting me stoked now. <laughs> but, yeah, we're working with some other local bands here, too. Like, um, all the California Street Music roster is going to be on it. Uh, Such a Mess is going to be on it. Uh, we're talking to some other bands. We might possibly have uh, something from Why Bother. If you know who they are, it's Nick mm-hmm. Steinborn's side project from the Wonder Years. Oh, nice. Uh, yeah, it's Nick's the guitarist, and he does the side project. It's Why Bother? Their last album was called This Very Isn't Very Good because Jason Tate from Absolute Punk reviewed the first album, and his <laughs> comment was, this album isn't very good. So they <laughs> their next album, This Isn't Very Good. But it's, it's going to be a cool thing. I'm hoping to get it out probably within the next month. It's going to be Choose to Pay. It's going to be a free download via Bandcamp. Um, if you chose to donate, rad. We're probably going to do like a physical release of 250 CDs. That's also going to be a donation thing. You want a free CD? Cool. I'll send you a free CD. Check out these bands. But maybe you might want to make a little contribution and help make somebody's life a little bit easier. And if you're one of my listeners hearing about this, pay. You can afford it. Pay. <laughs> you Seriously, can pay. Pay. Thank you, Eric. Yeah, pay. I pay a lot more it. than a penny. <laughs> pay a lot more than a penny. <laughs> but it's going to be a rad thing, and all these dudes, they, they're they all bands that have always been supportive of each other in the scene and uh, made some new friends out of it and had some old friends just get together with these new friends and make cool stuff and contribute and figure out how to lay this out and do this. And I got a sick tattoo artist, Nico Casala, who's out of Los Angeles, California, to redraw Andrew's CT scan with the bulging discs in his spine that looks super gnarly, but yeah. like a tattoo style. And it looks, it's cool. It's going to be a nice little package. I'm really happy to see it come together, and I'm really happy that people get to hear it soon. That's awesome. I'm so excited for that, and I hope uh, I hope you raise a lot of money for them. But yeah, um, you. if you could send me to any any of the stuff that you want me to throw up on the website, um, send me links, and I'll put yeah, it up. Definitely, man. But yeah, awesome. well, thank you so much for coming on. And, uh, thank and you for letting me be here. I appreciate it. Oh, of course. It. No, dude, it's awesome. Um, <laughs> am I, uh, well, I'll see you uh, on, on the interwebs, and I'll definitely oh, yeah. uh, see you on the Babe Talk. Yeah, I think we have a Babe Talk scheduled together in like two or three weeks or something, and according to the master schedule that just got released. <laughs> the master schedule that Ollie and Tony painstakingly wrote out. Must obey. Their blood and... Yeah. Yeah, so we'll, we'll, I'll be around. You'll be around. Yes, It'll man. be golden. <laughs> All right, man. Well, have a great night. Uh, I was so happy to talk to you. Cool. Right, later. Good, man. All right. Bye.